It was pretty clear to me, soon after coming to Christ, that my same-sex attraction wasn't going anywhere. And it's been almost 18 years, and my same-sex attraction hasn't gone anywhere. So for the first little while, I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do with this exactly? Because I know that the scriptures say no. And I've since learned Greek and Hebrew, and it turns out it still says no. Fine. That's never been the issue for me. But way before the phrase love is love was popular, I mean, that was the pressing influence on my life. I felt it. And so many times I returned to the image of the garden, actually. I felt like I was in such a similar position to Eve. You know, there had been this setup where God had created something beautiful and expansive for Adam and Eve to walk into, this glorious vision. But he had just given them this one prohibition. And it was a prohibition that kind of on itself didn't make sense. Like we would have understood if God had said, here's your one rule, guys, don't murder each other. We'd have been like, ah, yes, very good rule, right? Because murder's, you know, it's gross. You're murdering an image bearer. You can't fill and multiply the earth if one of you is dead. Like we would be like, yes, yes, very good rule. But the one prohibition that God states is don't eat this fruit on the tree in the midst of the garden. If you eat this fruit, you're going to die. And even vegans eat fruit. You know what I mean? It's sort of like the least obvious type of prohibition you could have. And this is exactly where the serpent plays to Eve. He gets her to use her data to evaluate the fruit, right? So she sees it's attractive. It's going to be delicious to eat. It's going to be desires to make her wise. She's got all these reasons why eating the fruit is a good idea. And the only thing she has on the other side is God's word saying, if you do this, you're going to die. And I felt so similar. Like I had all these reasons why saying yes to my same-sex attraction would make sense, why it was good. And the only thing I had on the other side at that point was God's word saying, if you do this, you're going to die. And Eve had every reason to trust that God was for her. But still, it proved too much. She ate Adam and We all live downstream of that bad decision, right? And so it pressed me constantly into the question of, can I trust him, even when I don't understand? Because it turns out if I'm only willing to obey when I understand and when I agree, then probably God is not my God, but I am my God, or I'm trying to make him into my image. And so I had to examine the life of Jesus over and over again. And it wasn't just that his death made him trustworthy, although that would be enough, but even that he came at all. He didn't owe us anything. He could have stayed. He didn't have to become incarnate. He would have died, stood in judgment, and been like, yes, you have to condemn me. But he chose to take on the burdens of human flesh and to live a really difficult life in addition to dying for us, like everything about what he did communicates how much he is for us. And so that over and over again were the first lessons of my Christian life where I I could get to a point where I would say, okay, even if I never understand this, I know that he's good and not just in like some ontological category, but he's good to me. And honestly, I think for most of us, when it comes to the sexuality issue, or frankly, any ethical issue, if we're not rooted in the character of Christ, it's really easy to drift off in one direction or the other. It's got to be about him. And each of us have to come to that on our own. Like, you can't live off of the fumes of my understanding because of where we are. Like, we, we have to come to it. It has to be real for us. 